the people that are really trying to get me are the ones that are auditing, and I use that, like auditing the five. So they're actually like, it's like they're not taking the course. You know, they're showing up in the back, <laughs> right, right, hoping right. that the professor uses the wrong pronoun. And that's that's so that's what I, I noticed that it's more like. So, you know, like, uh, you know, I would assume that at least once a week there is somebody deliberately trying to destroy my career. But I can't let that stop me. I have to. I, I, I've talked about this in previous books. We all have to share the risk. And I, I, and I have to always, I, I, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but I have to say that you helped destroy cancel culture by monetizing the act of being canceled. If you get canceled and there's another way out, you will always rise above. <laughs> I'm Dave Rubin and joining me today is the number one late night show host in all of television, as well as the author of the brand new book, The King of Late Night, Greg Gutfeld. Gregory, how are you? I am fantastic. Is it Gregory? So, is it Gregford? Who, what is it really? I like Big G. Because <laughs> I got a dog named Gus and he's Little G and I'm Big G. Is Gus with you today? Yeah, Gus is with me. Would you like to see him? I, I'd like to see Gus because everything you're okay. doing on Instagram is Gus related. Give the people what they want, then we'll talk about politics the, and media I, and all that nonsense. You look at the little boy. Oh, look at Gus. <laughs> look at Gussie, Gus, yeah. Gus. You love <laughs> He's like, what? he's looking for food. He's looking at my manager, uh, who's a big pushover, Eric. All right, you well, know what? Gus He's is gonna, welcome to make it. as many guest appearances. You are the king of late night and the walk on the guest appearance is a big thing. Before we do anything here at Gutfeld, I want to throw back to me. You know, you were the first, you, you were on our first show. Yes. What did you say? So I have to call you out for being the, because I doubted you. You, what did you say in the first show? Well, first off, before I tell you that, I just want to say on the off chance that I say anything offensive here during the Gutfeld exclamation point program, I just want to say that I'm doing today's show as a black lesbian. That's okay. what I am <laughs> identifying as today. But on the first show, the first Gutfeld show, mm -hmm. I was sitting in this chair and I said, you would be the number one king in late night within one year. And Greg. <laughs> It's not possible. Gutfeld, you did it even faster than I said. I got to give you, know you credit, it, man. Um, you were so certain that it was happening. I believe that you willed it to happen, <laughs> right? It's kind of like, you know, when Scott Adams talks about affirmations. It was the secret. It was the secret. You said it's going to happen. And you, I think I might have been a little reluctant. And you said, no, 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 no. There's no way it can't happen. And it, you looked, basically, you looked at the environment and you were right that there was this gap and they were all feed. Aw, now he's back. Um, and, and they were feeding Is off that one Gus little or your area. wife? What was that? Yes. Oh, that's Gus. That's Gus. Okay. Uh, he felt bad. Now, there is the dog that I know. But you were right. You were right. You hit it. And then it, I, I was going to say it was going to take like a year, <laughs> but it was six months. It was not even six months. All right, now he's going to go. That you got, you got five seconds of, of Gus there. We that got extra good. Gus. Well, you know, the thing yeah. is, man, it was obvious to me because you, you'd obviously been doing it at the weekly level. I'd done it a million times. It was, it was and is fun. And you, people always ask me about you. I get probably asked about you in terms of what he's like off camera more than anyone else. Uh, because, you know, you're sort of like right between corporate press and, and like online media. So everyone wants to know. And it's like, to me, it's like they turn on the camera, you are exactly the same, you're having fun, it's kind of messy. And yeah. how many people even work for you? You know, the other shows have what, 50, 60, 80 people working for them? You got, well, you got like two guys. 12, I mean, over, I mean, if you, if you factor in crew, uh, 12 people, 12. And I mean, like, you can look at something like Colbert, I think it's like a couple of hundred or, uh, let's just yeah. say, a, let's just say a thousand. A thousand, no, a it's thousand definitely people. a thousand people. <laughs> but I, I, so it's, I, it's roughly 12. Of course, we do use the studios that are used for other people. So that's, you know, but uh, we have, a, we have a small staff. And generally, you're right. I mean, it's like, uh, there's no reason for me to differentiate between what I am, you know, in the green room, or at home and what I am on the show. I'm, I'm 58. And I know I don't look it. Thank you. No, you look but, 56, honestly. Yeah, I look like I look a little smidge over 56. <laughs> but um, 
it's like, what's the point of working that hard? Uh, I got here this way, and and um, and like I, I. I can't be, I mean, I don't even know, I wouldn't know what else to be. So that means if I find that a story sucks in the middle of doing it, I will say it sucks. Um, if I lose my train of thought, uh, I will say I lose my train of thought. If I say a joke and nobody laughs at it, I'll be like, why are you laughing? I'm not <laughs> going to, I'm not going to sit there and be talk show host guy. Cause I, I'm not, I mean, I was, I keep saying this to people who say you're a comedian. No, I wasn't, I was running editorial meetings for most of my career, uh, I think right now, I guess now I have as much on TV as I did uh, in publishing. Publishing, I quit in 2004. So that was like 14 years. And now it's like probably like 13 years. How, how, did, you, how years. did you do that jump? I actually, I, I don't think I know. How did you do the jump from publishing? You were, do, you were doing men's fitness, right? Was it men's fitness? No, men's health. How uh, dare men, you? Men's health, sorry. How did you make that's that like, jump to? That's like comparing Fox News to Newsmax. Oh, <laughs> how dare you? Sorry, um, sorry. Actually, you know, it, it's the irony of this. And it's like, if you look backwards and try to reverse engineer a career, it's impossible. But it had to do with me being editor in chief of Maxim in London. And uh, I was interviewed for something called The Black Table by AJ Delorio, who then got famous because of the uh, Gawker uh, Oh, right, lawsuit. right, 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 right. And it was a really fun interview. And Matt Labash saw it. And Matt Labash had been asked to be an original blogger on the Huffington Post. And uh, I think the Weekly Standard wouldn't let him do it because Bill Crystal's an asshole. <laughs> and so... Um, uh, they can fact check uh, that. The fact checkers can fact check it's that. Very it's very easy to check. But, uh, but so Labash like, said, dude, you should do it. You should do it. And I go, I could probably do it because Maxim doesn't care. And so they, I, they must have sent that uh, Black Table interview, and then I get hooked up. And that's how I met Breitbart. And um, so there was like the first day that the Huffington Post launched, and I was like seven, eight hours ahead or whatever. And I wrote – I treated the Huffington Post like it was a, an online bulletin that's done by your aunt. So it would be like a lost and found. There's a weird cat in my yard. And stuff like that. So the first one was a, a a recipe for lemon squares, and so so when the when the thing launched, they had like something maybe by John Cusack or some celebrity uh, about politics, and then you would get to me, and it would be like you know here's a great recipe for lemon squares, and then an hour later I would post something like. I found this in my yard. It looks like a G-string. Does this belong to? And I would mention the names of the people on the Huffington Post. So it was almost like, you know what it was? It was like a bulleted board at a dormitory. Mm -hmm. So it was all these lost and found things, complaints, uh, get-togethers later. Like Byron York's going to have a get-together at his place. It was to create a fantasy of something that really didn't exist. Did you did you bring that to Fox? Or like, are you the guy that brought that? Because that is one of the things. You do it all the time. You make fun of everybody that's on the network. They make fun of you. And you can see you guys genuinely like each other. It's where the, it's where the, on, on CNN, when it would be Lemon handing it to Cuomo, it was like, you two despise each other. And, they would, and what did they say? I love you. Yeah. I love you, man. <laughs> yeah. I love you, man. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. like, it was so clear. They would sue each other into oblivion given the chance. But it was it's the, it's the secret sauce of, uh, I think, success or chemistry. The secret sauce to chemistry is the ability to tease people. And I've been doing this all my life. I get accused of being mean because of like people who don't understand the relationship between me and Kill Me. I love Kill Me. Yeah, it's great. Because, because Kill Me is the perfect foil. Like he, he just, he's just always like, what are you doing? And, yeah. like, and I would make fun of him. But it's because I really, I, I love his, his, the fact that he's impervious. And so we get along. A lot of people go that Greg is this really mean to Brian Kilmeade. He's really mean to Kat. And it's like Kat writes the introductions that I use. But the thing is, if you see me not teasing somebody, it's because they're not worth it. Or they're so thin skinned, it's not even like I don't want to get a call later saying like so and so appreciates that you just leave her or him out of it. I won't say who these people are, but there was like one female who's no longer at Fox who had her own show, who even, I even, I, I even apologized to her. Her name's not, doesn't rhyme with Moretta. 
brand Lustern, but it could be. I think I got it. Uh, yeah, I think I but, got it. Uh, I even apologized to her and she called me an awful human being and blah, blah, blah. But I realized like there's some people who have been in, I don't know, in this cloistered world so long that they're not used. They're not used to somebody saying a joke about them or, or uh, and I think uh, the only thing I said that was mean to her or bad about her was I, it was a softball interview with Trump. That was it. And it was just a silly joke and she, man, she was pissed. So I learned that like, okay, steer clear of the humorless people. Uh, I don't want them around me, but the people that I really like, I will tease them till the end of time because to me, that's the only way I can express affection. I'm not that, I, I'm not good at the other ways of doing it. So uh, it's like when I first, the five kicked off quickly because I made fun of Dana. Like mm -hmm. Dana had, Dana was in a world where nobody made fun of her. Right. And I, I, we were, we were seated together for height reasons. Cause you know, when you're, when you're planning a show, it's all about the lighting and you can't have me seated next to, I don't know, Jesse, cause he's tall and I'm short. So she's like this, I'm like this, so I'm actually more like this. And so we were seated together and it was like being next to the serious homeroom girl, except that she, you could tell that she, she was fun. There was something going on in there and she was never allowed to like go. Mm -hmm. So I just started, and I don't even know what I was doing. I was making fun of her, but in a, in a kid brother sort of way. And, uh, and that was, that was the immediate thing that kind of got picked up. And meanwhile, you know, there's Beckel who's hilarious, ripping on everybody, but anybody who wasn't amenable to teasing never lasts because they can't handle it. And they think like, oh my God, you made a joke about me and on camera, I need to be outraged. It's like, no, you don't. The moment you laugh and come back, everybody loves it. They no, love and it. And to your credit, I'll say something nice about you, man. We, oh, we, you. We've done it on your show where you'll make a gay joke about me and then I make a short joke about you. And it's like, we're not angry. It's so it, like these people that are just looking for everybody to be pissed. But do you think that, is that in a weird way more than anything, the secret to what, the, to you becoming the king of late night? Like, it seems so weird to me. Like Johnny Carson was the king of late night and now it's Greg Gutfeld that just, it's just so insane. You're gay? After 10 o'clock on weekends. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you're married to a guy named Dave. I just thought He's this gay. was all He's a sham. <laughs> I thought this was all just a way to get identity points, DEI, ESG. Pretty clever, my straight friend. It's a miracle you did it on your own. It was a long, but it was a long, it was a long game. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that um, uh, there's a bit of coziness with the celebrities. Uh, uh, when you bring a celebrity on, they're like in this cage and I don't like to do that. Like, uh, here, we're going to have this person come out. He's got a movie out. Don't ask him about the divorce. Don't ask him about, uh, you know, his kid being picked up for drugs. You, you have to talk about the movie. I can't, I can't do that. Because that's, yeah. like, you know, Jay Leno was, like, think about Jay Leno with, uh, who was the British actor? From oh, Love uh, it was that famous one. The, the, Hugh, the Grant. British, uh, Hugh Grant, thank yeah. you, yeah. I and think around said, 92, like, yeah. Yeah, and he said something like, it's funny how you know the exact date, Dave. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a student of Late of, Night. I'm 99%. Oh, no, maybe it might have been 95. Google Hugh Grant the name, on The Tonight Show. I think it was 95. Do you remember 95. the name of the hooker? She had a really cool name. She had a cool name like Daisy or something. She was beautiful, beautiful black girl. We'll get it. Uh, I, don't, I don't have 12 staff members, but I've got somebody with a computer in this room right now, and I'm going to find out know, what year was Hugh Grant on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno? 90, 95, I did it. And what well was the done. hooker's name? What was the hooker's name? We'll get Daisy Dottie. Daisy Dottie. Doreen. Doreen. Dora? Doris? Doreen. Doris. Delilah. Delilah. Divine Brown. <laughs> Divine. <laughs> you see what happens, Deep. Greg? We're, we're at the age. You're a little older than me, but we're at the age yeah. where you basically just have to point to people to ask them things. What happened yeah, that know, day? You know, they weren't even I alive. Mean, but I think that is like the kind of um, it is. The whole point, if, if you're gonna, if the show is no different than having people over in your living room. Yeah. And, and so the people at home get to know everybody better because they get to know the real you. If I'm making fun of you and you're making fun of me, they learn more about us than they would if you had showed up on any other show. Now you could argue, and I'm sure somebody would make the argument, Greg, if you had um, Hollywood celebrities on your show, your ratings would be higher. I don't buy that at all because we're beating them. Yeah. Um, and Carson and Letterman, they were different. I mean, they would, he, Carson, which is the next step, 
he had big stars, and they would just rip each other. Some of them would be drunk. Oh, you know, be incredible. Have, Dean Martin and, and Dean Martin, Sinatra. Oh, my God. Burt Reynolds. You remember yeah. Burt Reynolds? Oh, and yeah. Like, He'd go on with Dom, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it was great. And, and so I, I think, you know, I, I feel like the people that I have on my show are stars in their own right. Do, do you think it's kind of, <laughs> um, I guess, weird or bizarre that you're on a, a cable news network where everyone is watching you, waiting to destroy you at any given moment? You do a, more, a little bit more of a straight thing on the five, but, you know, you're, you're yourself, but the show is a little, let's say, a little more straight or what narrow than... It's we, weird because yeah. it's that what what um, the irony is more dangerous on Gutfeld. They leave me alone, right? But if they, it's the people that are really trying to get me are the ones that are auditing, and I use that like auditing the five. So they're actually like it's like they're not taking the course. You know, they're showing up in the back, <laughs> right, right, hoping right. that the professor uses the wrong pronoun. And that's that's so that's what I, I noticed that it's more like. So, you know, like, uh, you know, I would assume that at least once a week there is somebody deliberately trying to destroy my career. But I can't let that stop me. I have to. I, I, I've talked about this in previous books. We all have to share the risk. And I, I and I have to always I, I I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but I have to say that you helped destroy cancel culture by monetizing the act of being canceled. If you get canceled, and there's another way out, you will always rise above. Uh, the perfect example is Jason Aldean. Yeah, uh, yeah. Getting Target, his song goes to number one. There are a lot of other things, and then there's uh, then there's the reverse. That if you try to be the opposite of cancel culture, that is woke, that will have an effect like the Bud Light thing, where that is actually people, not social media, but people going, you know what? I don't like that they're trying to sell me something that's so fake, and it's it, and and they and by the way, the consumer had to be educated on why Bud Light did that. Bud Light was trying to uh, supply their brownie points for ESG or for ESG. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with the consumer. And so it meant, let's make fun of the consumer. And so the consumer's like going like, why is this happening? They get educated. They're going like, well, screw them. There's a shitload of beer out there I can drink. It doesn't have to be Bud Light. Yeah. What, what do you so make? You can have like, go ahead. No, 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 you go. You're the guest. Continue. I already forgot but, what I was going to say. You were going to make a, you were really going to bring home the Bud Light point. I think you were going to connect it to Target. I, every, here's, here's the thing. Yeah. Here's the thing. Uh, I don't believe that, that boycotts are good. However, I think that when you see that somebody is trying to pull a fast one on you, that's worthy enough to call it out and to avoid them. But, and then when you see somebody who's being unfairly targeted, that is when you share the risk. And that is when you go like, okay, I'm gonna go buy Greg Gutfeld's book because they accused him of being a bigot or a racist. Because I know he isn't, I wanna have the Jason Aldean effect where it's like, oh, so you said this, you said a song that has no black people in it, that has no lynching narratives, is racist. Okay, you're trying to destroy this person, I'm gonna make this song number one. What's your policy on when you're watching the clips of the lunatics of The View or the crazy people at the televised mental institution of MSNBC, when you're prepping your show, because I have no doubt you're going through the same thing I'm going through. On one hand, I want these people to be ignored and disappear and whatever. On the other hand, they, they are literally writing our shows for us, and I do think they have to be exposed. But I always have this little internal struggle with how much <laughs> yes. we, attention. What, so what do, we, what do we do with that, Greg? You know I guess it we, is? It, we monetize it, I guess. Is it's what you, like we, it's got, you have to take a tolerance break. It's, you know, when like people smoke, uh, let's say, the herb, uh, and you realize your, your, your uh, tolerance level's gotten so high, <laughs> uh, you need to like, take a tolerance break from... Uh, gotcha videos. Um, when I look at the view clips, if there is a punchline for me exiting it, then I got to use it mm -hmm. because everybody loves those clips. And yeah. if you have a good zinger, boo, you put that in there uh, and that's fun. A lot of people do it themselves on Twitter. You know, they'll, they'll tweet something and go, I can't believe this or whatever. But it's not, if, 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 if I have that clip, of, you know, Joy Reid. Like, I got bored with Joy Reid because yeah. everything was the same thing. And I realized maybe I'm helping her. But 
if I got a really good comment coming out of that, uh, that I know is a surefire laugh, uh, then you have the evidence there. Uh, you don't have to set up the joke. The joke is there. It's like, it's like a, uh, it's free money, as they say. Yeah. Since you're on the corporate side of this, so to speak, you work at a corporation, yeah. it's a big corporation. One of my things lately has been like, when I'm making fun of Joy Reid, it's like, to me, it, it's like, I don't know if at this point she's a willful idiot or just, or if she's genuinely the racist lunatic I think she is. But I keep thinking, isn't this really about not just the producers above her, so like the EP in charge of her, but the exec in charge of that guy, and then really all the way up? Like, can you just talk a little bit about corporate structure in, in cable news? Because I think people, I think people are wondering about that. Like, they know every day they put her on air, or they put right. any of these like, people. How can they do that? How right. can they do that? But then when they're when you're, I'm sure over in their territory, they were saying the same thing about Tucker or about me or Jesse. It's weird. MSNBC is weird because, excuse me, I'm having three fluids yeah. and I put up four. Yeah. Um, MSNBC didn't start this way. I mean, they had MSNBC had Tucker. Mm -hmm. And Tucker's sidekick, I think, was uh, Rachel Maddow, if I remember. Is that right? And they also had, yeah, and I think they had Charles Grodin. Oh, they, they did had, have Charles Grodin. They had, they yeah. had Phil Donahue. I mean, he was Phil a lefty, Donahue. but not bananas. Yeah. Yeah. So they there was, it was, didn't they had they drudge, had drudge at one point? Yeah. They had drudge. So it was kind of like they were finding their bearings. And then this was the beginning of the siloing where I'm going to this side, you're going to this side. And they saw a monetary possibility in creating a silo specifically for that. And then what happens is, and it's a, it's a destructive incentive and you have to be careful with it that you will be rewarded the, the more certain you are, not, not the more outrageous you are, but the more certain you are about your position. I have never been one to be, I, I don't like the idea of certitude and I think you're the same way. It's like, it's like it feels good to be wrong. It's like, yeah. it's, it's like a great feeling. Like I've had this, you know, this, you know, come to Russell Brand moment with him where it's like, you know, I was a dick to him and he was a dick to me. I was a dick to Glenn Re Greenwald. He was a dick to me on the Huffington Post. But you, it's like, it feels really good to realize yeah. that I was, I screwed up. They might've screwed up, but I might've might screwed up more. But it's like, if you are just that person every single day that comes in and goes, this is the most outrageous story. I've never been more outraged in my life. It is the worst. I don't even know. There was one person talking about me that said, I had to step away from the TV. When I saw, remember the line on Twitter wow. that you'd always hear? I'm literally shaking. I'm literally shaking, yeah. I'm literally shaking as I tweet this because this man is so disgusting. So it's like, it's that sort of thing uh, in this incentivized world of outrage that just creates more clicks and makes more money. And I think what happens is you might not even notice it. It's interesting when you see like people who get fired and they end up somewhere else and they change. So maybe Chris Cuomo, is he now at News Nation? He's probably not the Chris Cuomo at CNN. I know, right? he suddenly sounded a lot more like us, not that anyone's watching, but like, yeah. yeah exactly, exactly. And I think you're gonna see that with Don Lemon, uh, Stelter, the people that were, that put on the costume, then take it off. I don't think I have to take Are you saying Stelter off. was wearing a fat suit? Is that what you're yes, telling me, Doug? Boy, could you imagine if that, I mean, my goodness, could you imagine if he wore a fat suit? Yeah, the fat suit people, that yeah, that's an expensive yeah. fat suit. Yeah, let, Greg, let, me ask you, let me ask you some serious hardcore questions. Sure. You ready? Yeah. You live in New York, you sick freak. You live in New York City. Blue, 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 blue. Uh, you were there during COVID. I remember you were texting me pictures as all hell was breaking loose, literally outside of your apartment. Uh, what is going on with New York City now and, uh, do you, do you feel like it's ever going to turn around? We're going hardcore now for a few minutes. I think there's a sense of giving in, which is the same as giving up. I notice on Mondays and Fridays, there's not a lot of people in the city and it has nothing to do with weather or holidays. The people that can afford to leave, leave. So really, New York for a lot of people is three days. And and I, I, I come in, I, I go to the, I have a cabin about an hour and a half away and I come in Monday and it's amazingly fast. And I'm like, there's nobody on the road. There's tons of parking. And then on Friday, it's just, it's like, oh, I'm gonna hit a lot of traffic when I leave work on Friday. You don't, because yeah. everybody left on third, nobody's there. So I think what's happened is instead of trying to improve the city, 
the people just reduced their presence in the city. And so you still have, it's, it's strange how the sadness and the depression of a city has moved to Midtown. It's not like the Lower East Side. And right, it's not right. Like, yeah, it's, it's actually where people work because there's fewer people there. And so that when you have less foot traffic, you have more bad things. And I know that everybody says, oh, the broken windows theory has been debunked. No, nah, not really. I mean, when they keep arresting people that, that do little things and you find out they're wanted for big things, maybe that it's there. But I think that, like, you have graffiti, uh, you have theft, and it just gets worse. And then pretty soon you have – I have this weird – all I see on the streets when I'm driving up on the city from, like, I'm Soho up, I see – if I pick an age group, say the 35-year-old human being, women, they're all – in Lululemon going to their yoga or Pilates classes. They're just walking. The men strung out. Now yeah. I'm eliminating I'm eliminating tourists and UPS and FedEx. It's strange how the men have become thoroughly uh, almost emasculated by drugs. They're kind of just they're they're sad, they're depressing, but they're almost not harmful. Except uh -huh. for the ones that will beat the shit out of you or put you in front of a subway train. But it's like, but then you except have women. For those, you have, except for those. Except for those. A small exception. But you see women, uh, and they're going to work because it's almost like you walk, like, what's this strung out fentanyl laced guy going to do to me? And you, like, the worst, and, and so they take up the bus, the bus stops. They sleep in there. It's all yep. there. So that, so you have all these little middle aged women who are going to do their maid jobs having to stand, you know, on the side. But it's almost all drug induced men. Uh, drug-induced men, uh, drug-addled men, and women getting to their exercise classes. That's to me. That to me describes Sixth Avenue. What, what do you make of that? I know you're a Jordan Peterson guy, and you you pay attention to all this stuff. And what do you make about like what's happening to young men as a guy that like was writing a men's magazine and editing a men's magazine and all that? I I, I would say just off the top of my head, men are more inclined to take risks, which is why they're more into drug abuse. Women, when they run into problems, tend to look for help, whether it's self-help books or exercise. So in this weird time, you see a lot more women exercising and a lot more men abusing substances. I think that might be the thing. And because there's so many men that are like, they're not the same kind of criminal. Of, they're not like in the crack epidemic, uh, violent or dangerous because they're too strung out. And there's, mm -hmm. there used to be this belief that their drugs were being spiked with fentanyl and it turns out they're looking for it. I, I, that totally blew my mind when I first heard that because I'm going, there's no way because I've known, I, I, I've known three people personally that are dead from fentanyl and they weren't taking it on purpose. Oh, wow. But, but when you talk to those in the know with drugs, go, no, they're like, fentanyl is a desired, it's not... It's like the drug dealers wouldn't put it in there if they weren't making money. So there is a desire for that next level high. And I think you're seeing that on the streets. I think that there is a hole for meaning. And I think that people are filling it in the weirdest ways. And women are on their own. And men have kind of abdicated their role in society. I don't know if it has something to do with culture or what. But it's, I kind of sense that, that like, you know, we've retreated into our own camps. So when you see that in the city, I mean, you know, I freaking left LA. I used to live in New York City. So uh, now I'm here in the free state of Florida where it is just booming and flourishing and it's hot, but it's okay. It's the price to pay for freedom. Like I see all the goodness here. Do you, do you see any way out for the city itself? The people you're talking about, all that? I would, I mean, I think that it, it's like, oh God, it's like a marriage. Okay. So it's like you have a husband and a wife and each, and they're different, and they have to each bring their different tool set to the marriage, and you're missing the dad. So what the woman brings is the compassion and the caring and all that stuff. But without the dad, there's, you have, people aren't in jail, prisons are closing, uh, you can walk in anywhere and take anything you want. I feel like there needs, and, and this do is Do you again, pay for things work. at uh, Dwayne Reed or do you anymore, just walk, you, you just take, take whatever you want? Yeah, I take whatever I want. This this laptop I just walked out <laughs> of. And these these are not even mine. I took these from an, elder, an elderly woman at a bus stop, just ripped them off her head. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then I, t I told her to buy my book. 
And yeah. she did. <laughs> and she did. On her wow. Lap- she ordered it on her laptop before I took her laptop. Isn't that great? But I, the analogy all is, the bases. The analogy is imperfect, but what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is there needs to be some sort of uh, a yin and yang relationship between the carrot and the stick. And Republicans were always the stick. And Democrats have a hard time being the stick because they're supposed to be the carrot. And so they, like, the moment you have a Democrat, like, I don't know, Mayor Adams talking about justice and, or, or, or prison time, his whole side turns on him. You mm-hmm. need a Republican. So it's like there, it, you need to have the carrot and the stick, the, the husband and the, the wife. You need to have these, or the husband and the husband, uh, in your case, Dave and Dave. <laughs> which one of you is the stick and which one of you is the carrot? Have you ever thought about uh, that? Greg, can we take this off uh, camera? Yes, yeah, we'll take it off air. We'll, we'll, I'm interviewing you. I mean, come yes, on. What, what are you doing curious. here? You wait till just next curious. time I'm on your show. Then you can ask me the questions. <laughs> um, Let's talk politics. You want to talk politics sure. for a little bit? I um, guess, but I do have to go to work. What t- I'm supposed to go at All right, what give time? me 10. Give me 10. 10, 10 minutes? Five I'm minutes. I'm supposed to be at work. Uh, five. You get five, five minutes because right. I got to change and I got to go to work. Okay, we'll even do it quicker than that. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to deal with this Trump DeSantis nonsense. Everyone's angry. Everyone's fighting. Obviously, I, I love DeSantis. I see what he's done in Florida. I voted for Trump. I like Trump. I like his kids. But all hell's breaking loose. Everyone's trying to kill each other. Your take and how are you dealing with it? publicly and all that stuff. We know what we're seeing. And unfortunately, there may no, be no way out that there is a very little possibility that Trump won't be the nominee. And there's a strong possibility that he will lose. So we n- kind of know that. And I've, I've raised this question to people that I that are pro-Trump people. And I go, like, how can you reconcile this? And they go, well, the, the polls aren't telling the whole story. And I go, well, I don't know, man. It's like, Democrats want him to be the nominee. That's the red flag for me because, and it's not Trump's fault. It's the fact that there is a faction of people that hate him so strongly that they will put in the effort. Yep. You know, you got, if, if it's- They th- say it's, it, they yeah, say it every day. If, if it's 30% of the population that despise him, they're going to feel like 90%. And I, and I know that like to say that you're not going to counter that seems like you're giving in. But if you've got other candidates that could win, it's not. And that's the thing. It's like, and I, 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 I think Trump is amazing and hilarious. But it's like, I, I would say, dude, like, this is going to like, I don't see, I, I see you getting, obviously getting the nomination, but I don't know how you're going to win because these, it, 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 it's being set up so that you will lose. So that's my, that's my take. I think that's any, all you're going to get, Dave. Do you have anything else it. you want to say, Greg, before you go to work, whatever that is? I don't know what I'm doing. I love you, Dave. That's what I'm going to say. And uh, if you haven't no bought homo. my book, no, <laughs> if you haven't bought my book, uh, it's still available somewhere. And uh, you don't have to buy it, but I would love it if you did. And uh, you'll sh- you should be on my show very soon, I hope. If not, I, I will come this is over. to that craptastic city in September when I'm back awesome. on the grid. And we will yes. do a show. And then, uh, what do you say we uh, go out and get drunk after? Huh? Yes, no sex with monkeys. Goodbye, Greg. See you later. <laughs> if you're looking for more enlightening and maybe even humorous conversations, check out our comedy playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.